Okay, it's time for our next lecture, and this one is on hashing. And note that some of these are from a form, some of these slides are from a former faculty member, Rodham and Hilsha. So we're going to talk a little bit about hashing, which is another data technique um, that we use sometimes in computer science. The idea behind a hash table or a hash map is they're kind of concerned. It combines the concept of a linked list, which you probably talked about in 1030, and we're going to review some more later. Um, as well as arrays to provide a really efficient data structure for storing dynamic data um, where we have real easy lookups um, it's typically implemented as an array of linked lists with chaining and we'll see some more about what that means in a minute. Um, these are used a lot for example on your hard drive. On your hard drive on your computer what happens is the information is stored out on the drive uh, sometimes the information is not all stored consecutively in the same place on the drive either. It may be stored in little packets depending on if your hard drive is really fragmented or not. That's what you're fixing when you do a defrag. Um, but what happens is there's a lookup table on the uh, uh, inner tracks of the drive and what that lookup table does is it says here's the file name and then it points to often a linked list chain of uh, locations of where the data is actually stored. Sometimes we call that an index. You can think of it almost like a table of contents. So we go to this really small data structure that's like a table of contents to look up uh, the file name, then that tells us where on disk it's located without us having to go scan the whole disk just to find all the, the bits and pieces that, that make up the file. And so we use that with other kinds of data too. Some databases use some of these techniques and, and stuff like that as well, as you'll see as we go through here. So. So it's a fairly commonly used technique. Basically, each data item, whatever that may be, is associated with a key. Like in the case of your uh, file data, the key would be the, the name of the file. Um, and then we use a hash function to generate a hash value, which is where it's stored, okay, as you'll see. Now, sometimes, too, uh, because we're going to use a really small key compared to the number of possible locations we have, sometimes we have what's called a hash collision where two items end up with the same hash value. Then we have to have some way to resolve that collision. Uh, we may chain those, we may do secondary lookups, you're gonna see some of the different techniques as we go through here. The nice thing about these hash tables, and you'll learn, you'll talk more about this in your algorithms classes, but we start looking at ways to do things or algorithms to achieve uh, different uh, purposes. Um, we, we're interested in the order of the operations. You know, How long does it take? Uh, usually in terms of the value of n, how many values are there? Like when we were looking in the previous video lecture, we were looking at um, recursive relations for things like factorial. We said it had called 2 to the n possible uh, uh, function calls and things like that. So order n would mean the order of doing a particular operation on a data set was about the same on average as the number of elements, or 2n, or n squared. Obviously, as we get into exponential functions, those aren't as efficient at algorithms. Um, this particular algorithm for hashing, the nice thing about it is, is it's order one. You can't get any better than order one. Order one is pretty much perfect. That means no matter how many items there are, it takes us one operation to get there. It doesn't matter if there's one thing, ten things, a hundred things, or a million things. Uh, it's always order one. So if we can get order one, we're doing really, really good. Uh, anything more than that, you know, as we get larger, we're getting progressively worse from a performance perspective. Now sometimes we can't avoid that because of whatever it is we're trying to do. So we use a hash function to map the keys into the positions in the actual table where the data really is. So ideally if an element, call it E, has a hash key K and H is the function that E stored in position H sub K of the table. Um, and in an all perfectly possible world with infinite amount of storage, every element would have a unique key with a unique entry in the in the hash table that the function would just be a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, typically that's not the case, either because we don't want to maintain that many keys or we don't have a data storage that's possible to have every possible key have its own possible storage location. So um, if we don't find it, then of course that means it's not in, not in the, uh, the table. So hash function maps its input into a finite range. That's the hash value or hash code. Um, ideally, that should have a uniform distribution. Uniform distribution means everything's equally likely. In other words, we shouldn't have functions that make some values occur more often than others, kind of like rolling dice. Some values, rolling two dice, some values are more likely to occur than others. So uniform distribution is that nice flat um, curve uh, 
uh, it's not really a curve, it's a flat line, flat horizontal line in a uniform distribution where every input, the probability of an output is, is equal, if you will. Okay. Um, we use these a lot in things like cryptography, so those of you interested in networking and security, um, you're going to run across these not only in security parts of cryptography, but things like caches. Um, your computer uses a lot of different caches. This is the concept behind your disk cache and your internet cache, your browser cache, all that kind of stuff. And then there's some other kinds of things that are used for signal and image processing, stuff like bloom filters and stuff that use these as well. Um, there's different kinds of hash functions. Some are based on division, some on multiplication, some on more complicated kinds of things. Um, but for the most part, the math is pretty easy. Um, then there are ways to avoid collision, such as linear probing, double hashing, and some of these techniques we're going to talk about in the course of this lecture. So here's an example of, of student records. So we're going to store student records, much like we've been talking about uh, for your homework assignment. I'm not saying you're going to have to use a hash in your homework assignment, but it gives you the general idea. So the keys in this case are student ID numbers. Notice the range of student ID numbers is only about a about uh, 100 students or 1,000 students in this case. The range of ID numbers is 951,000 and 952,000, so we have a range of two of 1,000, but we're not going to have more than 100 students. So you can see we don't, it wouldn't be very efficient to have all the possible keys and have 1,000 locations. We're only going to have a few numbers of students. So we basically want a hash function where given a key, we're going to subtract that key from 951,000 because that's the first possible value we have, and that's going to map into a table of a thousand positions, that's the ideal one, so we have a thousand buckets, so everybody will have one, but we're going to have, you know, 900 buckets that we don't use. That's, that's why we're going to look at some other ways to do this in a minute, okay? So, order B, where, where B is the number of positions or buckets to initialize the hash table, and then order one to do any kind of operations, inserting, removing, or searching. So, because we've got to create that many buckets, it takes you know, one operation to do each one, so that's order B, and then but order one to do any of the operations, which is as good as we can get. We can't do any better than that. Now again, this is the ideal case. Now it's unrealistic because um, we're, we're wasting a lot of space. We've got 900. If we, by having a one-to-one -one mapping between buckets of keys, we've got a whole bunch of uh, space that we're not using. Um, so if the values, for example, of a key could go from zero to the full size of a two-byte unsigned integer, um, you know, we'd have 65,000 possible locations. We'd create that much space, but if we only expected 1,000 records, we're, we're wasting a whole bunch of a whole bunch of slots that we don't need. And so it's just really inefficient, memory-wise in this case, um, to do it that way. So if the key range is too large, we can use a hash table with fewer buckets and a hash function which maps multiple keys to the same bucket. That's called a collision. And then we have to have ways to resolve those collisions. So if we call the hash function h, and so the hash function for a particular key would equal beta, which equals the hash function for key 2, so if they both, basically, the hash functions for these two different keys both result in the same value, we've called it, represented it by beta here, um, then we say we have a collision at that slot, and we have to have ways uh, to resolve that, okay? And we'll see how to do that in a minute. So a real popular simple hash function is something like uh, K modulo D, where D is the number of buckets, so how many buckets we have in our hash table, in other words, the possible storage locations. Um, K modulo that would give us the hash function. So if I had a hash table with 11 buckets, um, it would be K modulo 11, so if I had the key 80, that would come out to be a 3, a key of 40 would be 7, a key of 65 would be 10. Notice, though, that a key of 58 would also give me a 3, and there's a collision, so we have to have some kind of a mechanism for resolving that collision. Okay, So there's a couple of different classes of collision resolution policies that we can use uh, to resolve those kinds of things. Uh, and then there's different techniques within those. Open hashing means that we're going to we're going to chain things. So if something occurs at the same location, that's okay. We're just going to build like a linked list or a chain of those values. So once we get to that location, then we just have to go through the chain to find the value we're looking for. Okay. Or a closed hashing, which means we're going to go put it in a different location. We're going to do a secondary lookup, if you will, or a secondary assignment. And there's, there'll have to be some kind of an equation, secondary hashing uh, function to do that. Okay. So it's a question, do we store the values outside the table, which is what open hashing does, and we're going to build up kind of like a, a storage location of, of, of little 
bins that, that go beyond the initial bin that's part of the table, or we're going to result in storing in one of the records at another slot in the table, and that's closed hashing. And we're going to look at, at techniques for, for each of those here over the next few pages. Oh, so, so closed hashing, which is the second one that we talked about there, this is the one we're going to store somewhere else in the table. This requires a rehash. In other words, a, a secondary uh, hash function that will give us an alternate location, saying, hey, I collided with somebody at this location, so I've got to put it somewhere else. So we tried to put x in bucket h sub x. It's already occupied, so we have to find an alternative location. Sometimes we have to try more than once, because we may go to the secondary location, it may be full. So we may have to go to a tertiary location. So in this case, we call h sub x the home bucket. Then we have to have a rehashing strategy. And the simplest one is a linear one, where we say we get the value of h sub x, add some value i to it, or semi-random, and then do the modulo d again. Um, so we add some value to it. Uh, it could be first time we had one or two, or it could be a random number. But anyway, we have different ways of doing that um, until we find an empty slot. And then we have to be able to use that same equation over and over and over so, so that we can uh, go find the data once we place it somewhere. Okay, so we generate a sequence of hash table slots that has to be a repeatable sequence that can hold the record. And we keep finding one, uh, looking for one until we find an empty one. So we call this a probing. So this is a linear hashing a probing technique. We're probing for an empty spot. And it may be on the third or fourth try or longer that we finally find an empty spot to store it. Okay. So let's look at an example of that. Let's say that d equals 8. I've got 8 spaces, which is represented in the picture over here. <coughs> Keys a, b, and c, d have these values. So h of a goes into 3, so a goes there. h of b goes into 0, so b goes there. h of c goes into 4, so c goes there. h of d goes into 3, and that's where we ran into a problem. h of d was 3, but we'd already had h of a was 3. So where do we put it instead? Well, we're, if we use linear hashing, we could say h sub d plus 1 modulo 8 would be 4. Ah, but that's in use. h sub d plus 2 modulo 8 is, five, is uh, 5. And so we put it there. If we needed to go on, we could find another location if, if 5 had already been full. But in this case, we found it. And we have a repeatable function that we know we can use to find the value. Now, and of course, what this does is it wraps around. So as we get up to larger values, eventually we'll end up with modulo 0 because it'll be 8 and then 9 would wrap around to 1, etc. So, so it may wrap around as well. So we examine until we find an empty bucket. Um, and after there's deletions, we may reach an empty bucket because something was deleted from there before. And of course, we can reuse that. That's OK. Um, we don't need to keep track of which ones have been used and which ones haven't, as long as we have a repeatable a function that we can follow in a repeatable process. So add one, if that's full, add two, if that's full, add three, or as we can find it that way. Now if there's lots of deletions, we may want to reorganize the table just to make things, things easier. Now we can improve that linear probing um, in, by doing some other kinds of things, like we could skip. In other words, take that value, if it's like one, two, three, four, five, or even if it's a random value, and multiply it by some constant. So we don't always check the first alternate location every time, because once we've done that once, it's probably in use. So we can skip a cer certain number. So we won't just keep following the same home buckets over and over and over in the probe sequence, just to speed up the process a little bit. So that's just a performance improvement kind of thing. Um, we can also do it with a random number. Um, so we, we have to use the same random number generator, the same seed every time, so it's repeatable. So we get to the same locations when we go to find it. Um, but we can certainly use a random number there, and that increases the likelihood that we'll find one on the first or second uh, try with probing. We just have to be sure that it generates the same pseudo-random sequence. And hopefully in 1030 you talk a little about random numbers. If not, we'll do some here. So here's an example. Let's say we're going to insert 1052. That's my key. Uh, so it comes up with a, with a value. We're using k modulo 11 because there's 11 buckets here. Um, so let's say the next had home bucket 0, whatever the next element was. We do this, and that would go to bucket 3, which is the same. And then elements, uh, for elements with home buckets 1 or 2, though, those would also go to 3. So we have to have different strategies of, of finding where those next ones might go. Open hashing, uh, 
we basically don't have to worry about those rehashing strategies. We just make each bucket the head element in a linked list. And again, we're going to talk about linked lists again next week, but you should have seen them before. Um, if not, you can ask me in class and I'll illustrate uh, what one looks like before we, before we start doing our uh, other classwork. Um, but the idea is all elements that hash to a particular bucket are placed on that bucket's linked list. So the, the first one that goes in there becomes the head, but then after that they just keep getting linked. So we basically have kind of like a dynamic array, if you will, at each bucket location of all the things that match that bucket location. So we don't have to do any rehashing. We don't have to look up another location. They're all there. We just then have to search through uh, the list to find, if we're coming back to retrieve a value, to find the one that we're retrieving for. So they can go in by order of insertion, which is the easiest, in other words, first one becomes the head, et cetera, et cetera. But you could also reorder the list. Every time one comes in, you could alphabetize them or do it based on frequency of access. That's, that's what caches do. The one that's at the head is the one that gets accessed most often, because if it's already being accessed most often, it's probably going to continue to be accessed most often. So uh, uh, that's kind of a, a most recently used or least recently used type type strategy. And when you when you take some computer architecture classes, you'll talk more about those kinds of strategies for dealing with caches and, and those kinds of things. Same thing with some of the stuff on your internet browser and the way it keeps track of uh, places you visited recently and stuff. So open hashing then, oops, sorry, would look like this picture. So we'd have however many buckets we have, and then once we did our initial hashing uh, function, if that took us to bucket zero, for example, the first time the element we get stored here, and then any other elements would just get stored with their key value on out here. So, so once we get to here, we'd say, okay, well, if this one doesn't have the key value that we want, then we go down this list. But we know it's somewhere in this list, in, depending on what order we put them in, et cetera, et cetera. So we never have to do rehashing, look for other buckets. We just keep adding them to this, this list. It almost looks kind of like a grocery store checkout line. So you know, people come in, you assign them to a line, and then you know they just keep growing out here as, as many lines as are open. If these aren't open, then there's nobody assigned to them. So how do we know when to use each one? Well, open hashing is most appropriate when the hash table is kept in main memory. In other words, we can do in-memory link lists and stuff, whereas the other kinds of things we use typically when it's being stored on disk or something like that. What we're hoping, of course, is the number of elements per bucket, in other words, the length of each of those linked lists, is approximately equal in size. So the list will stay short. There's not one particular bucket that gets most of the values. Otherwise, we have performance potential issues in it again. So if there are n elements in a set, then each bucket should get n over, approximately n over d of the values. If we can estimate n, then we can try and choose a d value, that modulo value, if you will, the number of buckets, to be, as lar to be large enough uh, the average bucket will only have one or two members. Okay, so that, that's a really brief introduction to hashing. Again, you're going to have a lab exercise where you're going to get to try it out. Um, and it's something that you'll continue to use in other kinds of uh, uh, computer science problems. It may or may not be useful in some of our homework assignments. Um, many of these techniques we're talking about um, could be used or not, depending on the particular approach you take to design. Remember in this class, I'm not telling you exactly how to do things. I'm not going to tell you, oh, you exactly have to use a linked list or you exactly have to use a hash or whatever. I'm giving you a lot of techniques and I'm going to let you choose how you approach the problem based on your own analysis or your own understanding. So that's an important thing to take into consideration as we look at these different techniques. They may be useful to you. It's another tool in your tool belt, so to speak, that you have available. Um, but you may not necessarily, just because we've just talked about it, have to apply it to the next assignment or something like that. So it's a little bit different philosophy than sort of your high school classes and even 1030 where things were very, very particular about telling you exactly what to do, no questions. I give you some choices here. You can choose to design things different ways and, and that meet your understanding and your abilities, and etc. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'll see you again in another one or in class. Have a good day.